uh, 6.30 p.m. in India. Sorry for the confusion. So welcome uh, to this course on the quantum phases of matter. Um, let me see, I have to share my screen here. All right, so I hope you can all uh, see the screen over the uh, opening slide. Uh, there's really two, I am, there's two of me on the Zoom uh, page, uh, my video on one and the slide on another. And uh, so welcome everybody. Um, so this is a sort of an experimental course. It was originally meant to be a course at TFR, but uh, has uh, for various reasons, as you know, become uh, more of an online effort. Uh, where I'll be lecturing from IAS, uh, Princeton, uh, at least for the first half of the course uh, with broadcast online. Uh, so I, there's also a YouTube uh, simulcast, but uh, certainly for the students. Uh, yes, sir. Where I'll be lecturing from IAS, uh, Princeton, sir, no, sir, I at want least to for the first half of the course uh, with broadcast online. Uh, okay, Dario, I'm hearing an oh, echo. I, there's also a YouTube uh, simulcast, but uh, certainly for the students. Uh, okay, I, I was. Uh, since no one's speaking up, everything's all right. Uh, okay, so. Okay. Says my internet connection is unstable. Excuse me. Um, anyway, so uh, this time uh, it's going to this this first lecture is fully online because I'm not at IS uh, at the moment, uh, but starting next week will be uh, fully online, uh, fully in the classroom at IAS. And I hope uh, if uh, COVID permits to uh, actually be in India for at least part of the lectures. Okay. Um, so uh, yes, I pretty much said all of this. The lectures will be 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Uh, New York time, Mondays and Wednesdays. Occasionally lectures may be moved to Fridays if there's some conference or some other event. Uh, today is the first lecture, September 1. Uh, the next lecture will be a week from today uh, where I'll be using the Blackboard uh, in Bloomberg Hall at IAS uh, on uh, Wednesday, September 8th. Um, this is a high, this is completely optional. On September sixth and seventh, I'm giving some lectures at ICTS in Bangalore uh, at another conference, and uh, you're welcome to attend those if you're interested. They are related to topics we'll cover uh, somewhere in the second part of the course. So one important uh, point here is that the course is really intended for graduate students at TIFR and ICTS. Uh, and those students should feel free to interrupt me anytime with questions and should be on the Zoom and not, not on, the, uh, on the YouTube. Uh, and the same goes, of course, for uh, the live audience uh, in Bloomberg. Uh, and if you're not part of these two groups uh, and you have an urgent question, try putting it in chat uh, and uh, I'll try to get to it. Uh, okay, all right. Okay, so uh, here's the background I'm going to presume. So I, you know, I don't really want to cover very standard material in quantum many body theory on which there are, you know, many ex excellent textbooks. Uh, I recommend the book, a uh, relatively recent book by Bruce and Flensburg. Uh, it has a, a, you know, rather nice discussion of the, of the basic technology. Um, I've also given lectures in uh, in Harvard courses. This is uh, 295B and 268R, which are on YouTube. Uh, you can also look at those. So the basic tools that I uh, expect you are familiar with, uh, you don't have to be experts at them. You know, we're going to use these tools, and as you use them more, you get uh, uh, you'll get more comfortable with them. Uh, but the method of second quantization. Uh, and basic Green's functions of fermions and bosons as defined in condensed matter texts. Uh, the usual route, the simplest route is to actually work in imaginary time and define the Green's function in imaginary time. 
and then use spectral functions to relate them to various real-time Green's functions. So, so that's very basic technology uh, worked out in great detail in Bruce and Fensberg and Feder and Valetska, Meha and uh, many other books. Uh, what I will also use, but uh, maybe not right away, is the path integral method for doing the same things. Um, this is also in many books, also not as many. Uh, there's a book by Nagley and Orland uh, that you can read, which has a very complete treatment of the path integral method and its connection to the uh, normal second quantization method. Um, anyway, so I'm, I'm told that uh, your local uh, uh, professors will you know, we'll be covering some of this, or you've covered this in previous courses, uh, and you have a week uh, before the next lecture. So if you're not fully up to speed or at least familiar with the terminology, uh, I encourage you to spend the next week uh, looking at some of these topics. Um, okay, and uh, there's some other topics we'll, we'll see, uh, which I may refer to to my lecture notes or my YouTubes. These are more advanced topics. I don't expect you to know them, although maybe some of you have already covered these topics too. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, and, uh, you know, the idea here is to <laughs> is to bring some value added where I give you uh, coverage of topics I'm most interested in myself and some recent experiments and connect that to standard uh, many body theory in solid state physics. Okay, uh, so this is the outline of topics I'm trying to cover. So today will be this lecture just an overview of various experiments. Uh, I'll go somewhat rapidly, I think, uh, so not expecting you to follow everything, but it get you a flavor of what are the experimental issues that have animated uh, this field. Uh, that's so that we today. Uh, and then I'll talk about basic models of uh, interacting fermions and bosons. And this is often in the context of the Hubbard model, uh, either of bosons or, or fermions, uh, and that these lead to various interesting phases, uh, which are all extremely well understood, which I'll call conventional phases, uh, meaning they are, can be characterized by trial wave functions, which are essentially products uh, uh, of, uh, of, of single particle states. Uh, they have some symmetries that are broken in some cases, uh, but essentially they are, single particle or two particle type phenomena, which are now, you know, rather conventional, well understood. Uh, then I go on to, you know, more complicated phenomena where we have, I guess, there's a lot of terminology, but let's say long range entanglement is probably one word that's used. Uh, and, and the basic structure of long range entanglement really goes back uh, to a trial wave function of Pauling and then Anderson called resonating resonance bonds. Uh, and today we have a you know, really rather complete theory of certain types of resonating resonance bond states. And the most basic one is the Z2 spin liquid, which I'll describe in great detail. Uh, more subtle forms of long end entanglement appear in, uh, in, in gapless states, states that have very low energy excitations. And these involve coupling to uh, gapless gauge fields. And uh, this is still to some extent a topic of current research, but there are emerging experiments. And, uh, and uh, um, so we'll cover that. And then we'll turn to metallic systems. So this is mostly in the context of insulators, at least sections four and five. Uh, I'll talk about the basic problem of a condo impurity in a metal. And then how, and that's, you know, the simplest situation where you have a metal, but you also have some strong correlations and some non-trivial entanglement. Uh, and that you want to go with a single impurity to more complicated phases, metallic phases, uh, with different types of uh, um, topological structures. And then also finally non-Fermi liquids and their connections to various uh, theories of quantum chaos and gravity. Uh, yeah, so this part, I don't know, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how we'll, exactly what we'll cover. It depends a lot on how far we get and uh, what the interest is of the audience. Okay, uh, so any questions on all that uh, overview of what we're going to cover and, and the mechanics of the course? Okay, I presume you can all hear me. <laughs> and uh, all right. 
Uh, okay, so let's get started with topic one, uh, which is uh, the topic of lecture today, is just the basic structure of solid state physics and the experiments uh, that you hear about often. And as a theorist, you know, what do you, what do you want to take away from those experiments and what are the kind of issues uh, that they've raised over the last, you know, 50 years, let's say. So here's uh, the outline of what I'll talk about. I'll begin with, you know, the very simplest example, which is just ordinary metals, and then go on to insulators, more insulators, Wittberg atoms, and you know, finally end with the cuprates, which is really what still continues after 30 years after the discovery to really, in some sense, give the most interesting and uh, most, uh, most difficult problems also. Uh, all right. So let's talk about ordinary metals. So, you know, like copper. Uh, so copper uh, is, has a bunch of valence and uh, d electrons in its atomic state. Uh, but when you, when you, and copper metal consists of a crystal of copper atoms. Uh, and mostly you can ignore uh, the, the inner core and it's the valence electrons and maybe one of the d electrons uh, that delocalize from the atom. Uh, and move through the entire lattice. And because of this motion, uh, you can carry current. But a little more precisely, what's special about copper uh, is that it has really the most, it has a Fermi energy and a Fermi surface. So here's uh, the band structure, the presence of a periodic potential of one of the bands of copper. Uh, and these are the filled states here and the empty states here. And the most important feature uh, is that there's a Fermi energy which separates in the free electron picture uh, the filled states from the empty states. Uh, that's really what allows these, these electrons that contribute to all the electronic properties that we're interested in, just excitations right near uh, the Fermi surface. Okay, so this, but of course, this is a three dimensional material. Uh, and in three dimensions, okay, I'm showing only two. Uh, the Fermi energy labels the Fermi surface. So there's a surface here, which is two dimensional surface in three dimensions. Uh, and for free electrons, there's all the uh, single electron states of the energy below the Fermi energy occupied and those above the Fermi energy are unoccupied. All right, uh, but what about interactions? Now, now, of course the electrons have Coulomb repulsion between them. Uh, so what do interactions do? Uh, but actually, uh, well, they do a lot, and that's what we're going to study, uh, but they don't change one thing. There is a very important invariant uh, that is not changed as you crank up the interaction to zero to some value. Uh, if the interaction is really strong, something else dramatic might happen. Uh, that's what we're going to study, really, the second part of the course. Uh, but for the long time, I would say until the 90s, it was accepted that nothing changes for even all the way up to infinite interactions. Uh, and, and the basic theorem for that, it's called the Luttinger theorem. And the invariant that I'm referring to is the volume enclosed, this, this volume that's enclosed by the occupied states. Um, so we can define a Fermi, the concept of a Fermi surface even with the presence of interactions. And we'll do that uh, probably in chapter three. Uh, and so there is a Fermi surface, very sharply defined in momentum space at zero temperature, and the volume enclosed by it doesn't change. Uh, more precisely, there's this statement. This is for spin full electrons. And here uh, also for the particle physicist, spin refers to, it's just like a flavor index on the electron. It's not, an ang it's not really a direct spin, which we won't refer to except uh, I mean, a few instances. So this, Electrons have uh, a spin index, which uh, or a flavor index, which is attached to possible values, uh, and it's unrelated to rotations in actual space. So rotation in the spin space, provided because spin orbit couplings are weak, are generally independent of rotations in real space. Okay, so the volume enclosed by the Fermi surface divided by two pi to the d, uh, that's the number of momentum states, uh, and you multiply that by two for a factor of spin. And that must equal the density of electrons. Uh, so this is uh, also dimensionally correct because the volume in momentum space has, has units of inverse volume in real space and density is a number per inverse volume. So both left and right inside have units of inverse volume. And the mod two is telling us that 
uh, we're not counting filled bands. Uh, that if the band was totally filled uh, up, to, up to here, if all these states are occupied, uh, then such a band doesn't count. So we can drop filled bands and that's the mod two. That's really the crucial way that the periodic potential comes in. Okay, so that's the basic structure of, uh, of a metal uh, and the Luttinger theorem. Uh, I mean, so the modern understanding of the Luttinger theorem is, you know, part of a very whole sequence of very deep theorems uh, that will underlie, you know, much of the course. Uh, it was a piece of, you know, 21st century physics that was discovered in the 20th century. Uh, you know, another version of it is the lipschultz mattis theorem, and then hastings oshikawa theorems, and, and it goes on to uh, very sophisticated ideas. Uh, or using anomalies uh, in topological phases that are all connected in some way to the basic Luttinger theorem. And then the basic idea here is that there's a global conserved quantity, which is the density of electrons. Uh, and whenever you have a finite charge density uh, of a globally conserved quantity, so here the charge meaning the number of electrons is non-zero, uh, then there are some constraints that are placed on the low energy theory from the presence of that non-zero charge density. And that Luttinger theorem is the, is the first example of that type of constraint. Okay, and hopefully, you know, I, I'm by, by no means very mathematically sophisticated, but you'll get a flavor of how these things are connected uh, as we cover the topics. Okay. So how do you detect the, uh, uh, the Fermi surface? Uh, well, uh, the most famous way to do it is to measure quantum, the so-called de Haasman alpha oscillations. Uh, so these are oscillations in the resistivity of the metal as you uh, apply a magnetic field. So here's the Fermi surface of silver. It's almost a sphere, uh, but it's connected by these little necks uh, to the sphere in the next Brillouin zone. So this sphere here is the same as that sphere over there. Uh, and it's, so it's multiply connected, a little more complicated. Uh, and if you look at the oscillations, there are two periods. There's the slow period and the very rapid period. And these periods are related to two different orbits of electrons on the surface. There's the very small orbit here that gives you the slow period uh, and the very big period here, which will give you uh, the rapid period. So by uh, changing a magnetic field in different directions and, and seeing how all these periods evolve as a function of the direction uh, today, you can, you know, by computer, basically reconstruct in great detail the full shape um, of the Fermi surface. So, so that's the basic measurement that tells you about the Fermi surface. Uh, so once you have a Fermi surface, uh, then that leads to lots of properties. And we'll see some of this, or I suspect, hopefully you've seen some of this earlier. Uh, the specific heat uh, has a linear dependence on temperature with a coefficient uh, gamma, which is proportional to the density of states at the Fermi level, sometimes called a Sommerfeld coefficient. Uh, so this tells you something about the effective mass of the carriers uh, near the Fermi surface. The spin susceptibility, uh, so this is the reaction of a magnetic field, a Zeeman field acting on the spins of the electrons. Uh, that's non-zero at zero temperature because there are zero energy excitations on the Fermi surface. So we call that chi naught. Uh, and that's also proportional to the density of states. So there's a dimensionless ratio, which is uh, the ratio of gamma to chi naught, uh, which the density of states cancels out, sometimes called the Wilson ratio. Uh, and in some cases it's a universal number, in other cases it's not. Uh, in the uh, uh, in Fermi liquids, the ratio of gamma to chi naught is a is a dimensionless measure of the strength of certain interactions, a Landau interaction parameter, if you know what that is. Then another feature of metals. Uh, now this is for a typical metal which always has some impurities. Uh, perfect metals are a little more complicated to think about. Uh, there's a res resistance at zero temperature, uh, which we call the residual resistivity, which is rho zero. Uh, and then the resistance increases the temperature as T squared. Uh, and this coefficient is often called uh, A. And there are also relations between A and gamma. Uh, that's sometimes called the kardowarsky woods ratio. And okay, so there, there's a whole, uh, you can spend the whole semester just thinking about theories of metals and how these quantities are related and to other observations. But it's all been an extremely successful and quantitative theory 
which applies to you know many many metals uh, and invariably it does and even when you don't expect it to it's, it seems to work it's really quite powerful okay so those are metals and i have now you know they were the focus of a lot of work beautiful work in the 60s and 70s and earlier okay let's go on to point two uh, insulators so you know, diamond is a great example of an insulator uh, and uh, just made up of carbon atoms in a diamond lattice. Uh, and now the important point is that the mobile electrons, the bands you're interested in, there's an even number of them, four of them. Uh, and so if you now look at the bands of uh, diamond, uh, you get uh, an even number of electrons per unit cell. So the bands are completely filled. And so this is what you call a band insulator. Uh, and it's also sometimes we call this a trivial insulator. Trivial insulator because uh, there's a, just a unique ground state with a gap to all excitations uh, for the Hamiltonian. Uh, and there's no broken symmetry or anything. To have any excitations, you have to take a particle from here and put it to the next band, which I, which I haven't shown. Uh, and it's because of that band gap, uh, diamond is transparent. Uh, Light can go right through. Okay. So also, you now notice because of an even number of electrons per unit cell, uh, if you apply the uh, the Luttinger theorem, you know, which you should in principle ask, what does the Luttinger theorem predict in every case? Since the density of electrons is exactly two or four or six, uh, the right hand side of this is zero, so there is no Fermi surface. Uh, so that's also consistent. So you. So Luttinger's theorem, you know, seems to tell you more than something about a metal. It also tells you uh, when can you get an insulator. And this seems to be the only, in, if I believe Luttinger theorem in its form applied always, uh, you would then conclude you can only get an insulator when you have an even number of electrons per unit cell. But we'll see that's not always true. There are examples where you get insulators with an odd number of electrons per unit cell. Uh, but they are very subtle. Uh, they require a violation effectively of the And that, of course, will be a big focus of what I'll talk about. So, I'll, in fact, I'll introduce uh, some more subtle insulators, which, you know, are fairly well understood. I would say, you know, Topics one to five is where things are in pretty good shape as far as experiment and theory are concerned. Uh, six and seven is where there are probably more open questions than, than things are understood. Okay, any questions so far, especially from the students in India? All right, so then let's go to mod insulators. So there's a, yes, I can't hear you very well. Go ahead. Hi, sir. Uh, so yeah. I'm saying that the temperature dependence you showed for different quantities, right? Like uh, chi and uh, specific heat and resistivity. Yes. Uh, yes. Those are in which temperature ranges? It's probably, I think it's not true for uh, if, I, if I take any range of temperature, right? Yeah, yeah. So these are, these results are for the temperature uh, much, much smaller than the Fermi temperature. So there's a Fermi ah, okay. energy and you can convert right, right. that to the net temperature by whatever, yeah. uh, KBT equals uh, EF. Yeah. Uh, is, and there are corrections, and typically the corrections uh, are in uh, even powers of, uh, you know, T over TF squared. You get corrections of that type. That's the leading correction. And the Summerfield expansion gives you some of those corrections. So those are subtle. Uh, uh, they are present in every Fermi liquid, uh, and uh, they involve knowing uh, something about the interactions. And in fact, in two dimensions, the subtle, for sub certain quantities like the spin susceptibility, they can, you can even get smaller powers than T. Okay, but that's a uh, subtlety we want.
complicated in structure, but the most important part of it uh, is the square lattice of copper sites. Uh, and even on the copper sites, you can ignore all the other orbital, copper orbitals uh, and just focus on, uh, on one, uh, one orbital. So and forget all the others. Okay, so there's a, something on the chat. Excuse me, Subir, yes. we couldn't hear the last few minutes. So could you repeat what you said in the last few minutes? There was some internet issue. It could be my, my headphones. Let me try. Yeah, so so in just the last few minutes, you started more or less where you started this slide. Okay, uh, can you hear me better now? Yeah, that was perfect. Yeah, I think it's my headphone. I'm having problems with it. Sorry. Yes, yeah, Sabir, I think you. I think it was a wireless issue with your headphones. It, it was intermittently cutting out. So try it this way. It should work better. Yeah. Okay. So this is. Uh, hopefully, there's no background noise. I think yeah, this room is. It sounds quiet. good so far. All right. Great. All right. Thank you. So, uh, so Nadia, I start with the about insulators. Is that where you lost me? Okay. So I, I presume uh, this discussion of. Corrections going as T over TF was clearly heard. Uh, and let's go to mod insulators. All right, so I was saying the most famous mod insulator is lanthanum copper oxide. Um, and you can, it's a complicated structure, but fortunately people have done the calculations uh, and everyone agrees the, and experiments also confirm that, uh, that you need only focus on a single orbital on copper sites. It's a certain dx squared minus y squared orbital, but that's not important. So you have one orbit, one state per site. Uh, and also in this mod insulator, there's one electron per site. So now immediately from the Latin theorem, you come up with the answer that since the number of electrons per unit cell is R, this must be a metal because the size of the Fermi surface is not zero, so it must be a metal. Well, it's not a metal. Uh, it's a very, very good insulator, um, but in some ways it's, that seems to be easy to understand by the phenomenon of broken symmetry. So what happens is that if you have to look at this particular material, you have one electron per site, uh, what they do um, is they form uh, this kind of arrangement where half the electrons point up and the other half point down. So this has broken the symmetry uh, because uh, the translational symmetry of the square lattice has been changed. And now the unit cell, uh, is doubled if, if you include uh, the spin of the electron. There's a doubled unit cell with two electrons per site. So once the symmetry is broken and the unit cell is doubled, you have two electrons per site. Uh, and therefore, this thing can be an insulator. Uh, so, and it's by the Lettinger theorem. So it's nothing that shocking. All you have to allow for is a broken symmetry. Uh, and this way of looking at this an insulator is sometimes called the Slater way. This would be a Slater insulator. Uh, but yet I'm not calling it a Slater insulator. I'm really thinking of it a mod insulator uh, because that point of view of thinking of this system as a Slater insulator, or in other words, just like a band insulator like diamond uh, is formally correct. That is, you can smoothly go from this insulator uh, to a band insulator uh, without having any phase transition. So formally, this is a band insulator once you've broken the unit symmetry. Uh, but much of the physics is not the physics of the band insulator. The energy scales are totally wrong. Uh, so it's better to think of it as a mod insulator, which just happens to have a little bit of broken symmetry. All right, so with that, and uh, too many hours have been spent debating this point, but I'll just call it a mod insulator um, because uh, much of the physics is connected to interactions. Let's just put it that way. All right. So the, the definition of a mod insulator is one where there's a symmetry breaking phenomenon or what is the definition? Well, it uh, depends on what, <laughs> depends who you're talking to, but the formal definition, I would say a mod insulator uh, is an is a, is an insulator which is uh, which is insulating which the Luttinger theorem would predict is a metal which is not allowed to be an insulator in the free electron approach. Uh, yeah, so I think that's the definition. We'll we'll meet an example of a true mod insulator in a few minutes. 
this is not a true mod insulator because once I have the broken symmetry, then I can smoothly connect it to a band insulator. Okay. So if you had something with odd number of electrons per unit cell and no broke and no broken translational symmetry, then that's a mod insulator. Okay. All right. Uh, but I'm calling it a mode insulator anyway because it's, uh, well, because I'm not a mathematician and it's really important to think of interactions in its properties. Uh, and everybody else does too. So that's too late to change the terminology. Okay, so, so why do the sims, uh, spins have this opposite arrangement? Well, that's because of the strong repulsion between them, which we encapsulate by the Hubbard repulsion U. Uh, so when two electrons come on the same site, there's uh, extra energy U, so they don't like it and they go back. Uh, and, but the amplitude for this, uh, so it takes a matrix element T for the electron to hop from here to there. And once it's there, it pays an energy cost U. Now, if the electrons are both parallel, this process would not be allowed. So it's better for, and every, every process in second order perturbation theory lowers the energy as we look at quantum mechanics. Uh, so therefore, it's better to have the spins anti-parallel. Uh, so from this, you can derive an effective Hamiltonian, which we'll talk about a little bit in the later in the course. And that's the famous Heisenberg exchange Hamiltonian between a spin a half operator that acts on the spin on each side uh, and an exchange coupling J, in this case, nearest neighbor, which is four T squared over U. All right, so now if you want to minimize this energy, if these were just classical vectors, then this is, would be the global minimum of energy or its uniform rotations. Uh, but this is a quantum system, spin a half, and that's where the fun begins. What is the effect of quantum mechanics uh, on models, on mod insulators with this? So let's talk about quantum fluctuations uh, on this kind of mod insulator. Um, so here's, let's take another simpler model where I take some of the BAM, the exchange couplings uh, and on the green lines, I divide them the fact of lambda. So lambda is greater than one uh, and I deform the system as a function of lambda. When lambda equals one, uh, then I know that it's, uh, this is the ground state from experiments and numerics and so on. I certainly haven't proven it, but there's no question that's the answer. Uh, and we are interested in what happens as you keep cranking up lambda. Uh, and now you notice, I mean, uh, I've explicitly broken the translational symmetry. Now the Hamiltonian also has two sides per unit cell, not just the ground state, but the Hamiltonian has two sides per unit cell. Um, and so, you know, there's nothing, uh, uh, you know, even the Luttinger theorem for this Hamiltonian would tell you uh, insulators are allowed. Uh, it could be a metal, but insulators are allowed and even trivial insulators. So we're really talking in some sense about trivial insulators. So in this case, there is a, when lambda becomes very large and the green bonds are practically zero, then there is a simple example of a trivial insulator in the sense that no symmetry is broken at all, um, where the spins bomb singlets. So when lambda goes to infinity, you can ignore the green bonds and the exact ground state is what I've shown on the picture. So the spins just form lock into singlet uh, so sometimes it's called a quantum paramagnet, uh, and these are it's like a valence bond crystal, but it's not strictly that because the Hamiltonian itself um, has the same symmetry as the ground state. So, so this is if I took this model uh, with in large U, I find this ground state, uh, and uh, this is an insulator with the gap to all excitations, and Luttinger theorem also tells me it should be an insulator. And I turn down u, uh, and I can go all the way to u equals zero, and I'll get a band insulator. So this state is smoothly connected to the band insulator. Okay, there's no question of even any broken symmetry. So it's truly a, a, a trivial insulator. There's a little bit of entanglement just in the near neighbor spins, but not any kind of long range entanglement. Okay, so this is a, a trivial insulator. All right, so now. We, so therefore we have found uh, something interesting happening as a function of lambda. For lambda equals one, it was the uh, nail state with the broken spin rotation symmetry and large lambda 
um, it's got no broken symmetry and it's a trivial insulator. Uh, so yeah, okay, this is the ground state for, for large, for lambda equals one. Okay, so then you can uh, look at a phase diagram as a function of lambda. Uh, and so there should be some critical point lambda C uh, where you go from the, uh, the na this nail state or an anti ordered anti magnet to spin singlet bonds, which are smoothly connected to, you know, the lambda equals infinity limit. Uh, so today for this model, we know precisely the value of lambda C. I'm sure I don't have it to many decimal places. And, and this particular condition has been uh, very thoroughly studied. Uh, also, more interestingly, you can actually see this condition in experiments. This is supposed to be a talk about experiment. Uh, so thallium copper chloride happens to be a material when you apply pressure undergo this type of condition. Uh, so this is the complicated structure of it. Uh, these are the copper atoms. Um, and, uh, you know, so the two possibilities to what happens to the spins on the copper atoms, uh, they can uh, form singlets with each other uh, and have no broken symmetry, um, or they can break the symmetry and form a state where there's uh, a long range antiferromagnetic order. So there's a question in the chat. Uh, why there is only singlet? Uh, so. Now there's also a triplet, I'll come to that in a minute. So if I just take these two spins here, the ground state of the, this Hamiltonian with the red is the singlet, but there's an excited state where it's a triplet. So let's, that was precisely the next point. Uh, so what are the excited states uh, of these two systems? So we're on the right-hand side, uh, there's the triplet, they can be a triplet excitation on, on this strong bond. But this is not an eigenstate because it can hop from side to side because the green bonds are not exactly zero. And so this is, yeah, the animation doesn't work so well on my iPad. So you can now see this, this triplet hopping from side to side, moving vertically. Uh, there you go. So there's this, and this object carries total spin one. Uh, again, there's not direct spin, it's just a flavor spin. Uh, and it's a boson, it's a boson with threefold generic spin. Uh, and um, that's what this object is. There's a field theory of thinking about it, uh, which we say something about later. Uh, you write down an order parameter phi for this broken symmetry. Uh, and the potential for the order parameter over here is just the uh, parabola in three dimensions because phi has three components. And so there's three harmonic oscillators with a finite frequency. And that frequency corresponds to the gap of this triplon. Uh, and so those oscillations are precisely this triplet particle. Okay. Uh, then on the, on the left-hand side, we have a very different sort of excitations and uh, sorry, we won't see the uh, oscillation so well. Uh, so you have the spins here and now you can see the spins waving and they all collectively wave and that has zero energy if they are completely spatially uniform. So that's like a Goldstone mode. Uh, these are sometimes called spin waves. If you want to take uh, this V of phi, now it has a, the Mexican hat shape, and there are two types of excitations. There's the spin waves, which are motion along uh, the ridge of the hat, but there's another at longitudinal excitation in this direction, which is the analog of the Higgs particle, although there's no gauge fields here, so that's not necessarily a very good use of terminology, but it's often used in the literature. Uh, so here's an actual experiment on thallium copper chloride. Uh, this is the spin wave excitation on the nail state. Sorry, the two sides are flipped. Uh, this is the Higgs particle right here. Uh, and this is the triplon uh, on the quantum paramagnetic side. Um, and you know how they all meet here, you can have a lot of wonderful theories of what happens there. And, but that really is not something I won't go into, but it's extremely well understood. Uh, Okay, okay, this is I've already said, or oh, this is the broken valence bond, the triplet excitation of the paramagnet. Uh, these are the spin waves and the Higgs particle. Uh, and then you can ask, what about right at the critical point? Well, this is where we now meet uh, our first example um, of a non-trivial quantum state. That is a state that cannot be understood 
uh, in terms of some very simple uh, product wave function uh, uh, of the electron. So in this case, you know, there's a product wave function, which is a product of singlets, and you take the product of all of them. And here are just a product of up down, and then you put corrections. But the starting point is a very simple sort of mean field wave function. Uh, that doesn't work here. There is no simple wave function you can write down here. Uh, and you have breakdown of many things. You don't have a simple ground state wave function, uh, meaning that, uh, and the modern way to say it is long range entanglement. Uh, and you also don't have particle like excitation. There's also a breakdown of the quasi particle concept. Uh, and you have really uh, a, a very complicated state. I should say that's in two dimensions, not in three dimensions. The experiments in this system are in three dimensions. Uh, okay, these are details we may get to later. So the, in fact, we know a lot about this critical point, at least in two dimensions. Uh, and uh, it's a conformal field theory in two plus one dimension, the most famous uh, conformal field theory in some ways, the Wilson Fisher theory, uh, going back uh, many years to the 70s where it was first discovered. Um, and here it appears there, it was originally applied to classical phase transitions at finite temperature in three dimensions. Uh, here would apply zero temperature for quantum phase transition and leads to some very subtle properties of the quantum critical point that weren't apparent when you were thinking about it as a classical system in one higher dimension. So one of those subtle properties is long range entanglement. Uh, so what you can measure is something called the entanglement entropy. Um, this, is, this is supposed to be where the, anti where the system is sitting and you take uh, a bunch of spins inside this region A um, and you trace them out. Uh, and then you look at the density matrix that describes the rest of the system. Uh, and that leads to something called the entanglement entropy. And at zero temperature, you'll find that the entanglement entropy is proportional to the, the length of the boundary, uh, which is, okay, uh, which is actually quite universal in quantum systems. Any quantum system with short range interactions will have that property. Uh, but what's subtle here and universal and, and an indication of long range entanglement is that there's a correction, a negative correction, sometimes called gamma, which is actually a universal number. It's independent of the precise Hamiltonian. It only depends on the shape. Uh, or the case of a circle, uh, circular boundary, uh, it's a, even more universal number that's related to uh, things in particle physics, uh, the, the partition function on S3 of the conformal field theory and so on. And that's played a huge role in many things in, uh, in uh, field theory. Uh, okay, but it's quite subtle and it's you know, difficult to compute for something like the Wilson Fisher fixed point. Uh, but this is one indication, the fact that there's this, this offset that measures the long range entanglement. Okay. Um, right, and I've also said that there's some relativistic theory that describes this critical point. Okay, I, I should, yeah, and it's a conformal field theory. So I won't be spending too much time on this particular aspect. This is just to get you a flavor of things that many people have worked on, which has now experimental realizations, not in this particular system, but in another system, um, which I'll hopefully mention in a few minutes, uh, Rydberg atoms there is a way of accessing a conformal field theory in two plus one dimensions. Okay, uh, what time is it? Where's my clock? Okay, so I'm about halfway through, all right. Uh, another interesting point, which has dominated a lot of research, uh, but, and it's still a topic of research, which I will mention a bit later in the course, uh, is what happens where you preserve square lattice symmetry. Suppose I started at lambda equals one, and then you tune some other parameter, like say the strength of the second neighbor ex exchange or something like that. So you have to now, we don't know what's gonna happen, but what happens is that uh, from numerical studies, we know that what you go to eventually uh, is, uh, is pretty much the same trivial state, uh, the valence bond, which with these bonds, single spins form valence bonds. But now this is not really trivial because the Hamiltonian does not have the symmetry. There are four such ways of forming such a state. It can go this way or it can go horizontally like this. 
or it can be shifted by one lattice facing either direction. So this state also has a broken symmetry. Uh, and so it's not completely trivial. Uh, and that changes the whole ball game. Uh, and the nature of this critical point is still a question of some debate and exactly what's going on here, we don't know, but you require much more sophisticated field theories to understand the transition from the nail state to the valence bond solid. All right. Okay, so let's go to go back, to continue the discussion about insulators and talk about the triangular lattice. So, which there are various experimental realizations. And uh, this is experiment situation. I'll give you a little bit of survey of what's known. So you take the same model, uh, exchange interaction between spinner halves on the vertices of a triangular lattice. And uh, if these were classical spins, then this would be the ground state and its overall rotations. Um, you know, there are three different uh, orientations of the spins. Uh, and in fact, there's no uh, spin rotation symmetry left. It's completely broken from, you know, the SO3 spin rotation symmetry is completely broken. Uh, and unlike the nail state where there was one axis of symmetry that was not broken. Uh, so that's why it's called non-collinear uh, nail order. Uh, and, and in fact, today we know that for the nearest neighbor interaction, just j single J, this is the ground state or smoothly connected to the state. Um, it's an insulator uh, because of the repulsion between the electrons, but also because you have, uh, you know, have uh, uh, enlarged the unit cell. Okay. Um, but now we imagine that, you know, this is not, this is not the real world. In the real world, there are other interactions. They can be second neighbor interactions. They can be ring exchange terms around a plaquette. Uh, various other, you can, you're going to add some dot, dot, dot here. So we're going to add some other terms and ask what are some other phases the system can form? Okay, so one, so before I get there, let me just show you one experiment. Uh, this is just fairly recent uh, in this compound. Sorry, don't ex ask me to pronounce it. Uh, I think cobalt is the active uh, ion here, magnetic moments. Uh, and indeed, they form triangular lattices, which are layers, uh, and they have this kind of uh, three sub lattice structure that I was just showing you. Okay, so this is one material that forms that kind of ordered state. Um, okay, another possibility we could imagine uh, is just like the uh, um, trivial valence bond insulator we saw earlier, where the spins form nearest neighbor valence bond and freeze into the structure. So this is what we call a valence bond solid, but there's six equivalent structures. You know, it can point this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. So there's a six fold uh, Z6 rotation symmetry broken by this valence bond solid. And this is another possible state uh, of that particular Hamiltonian. Uh, and just recently, you know, literally weeks ago, uh, there was a paper of this horrible organic compound, which people tell us can be modeled by just spin a halves on a triangle lattice. Uh, and they've seen in this experiment, uh, precisely this type of valence bond solid. Okay, uh, but this, I mean, this particular compound has been under a great deal of study for many years and uh, opinion has been evolving of what it's doing. This is the latest, uh, latest uh, conclusion, I should say. Okay. All right, but the most interesting one, uh, is the one originally proposed for the system by Anderson, uh, which uh, was called the resonating valence bond state. Uh, I'm going to be, to be more precise, I'm going to call it the Z2 spin liquid. And we're going to study this particular state uh, in great detail. So now this is really the first true mod insulator because I'm, we are going to be in a regime uh, where the Leibniz theorem no, no excuses will say this must be a metal because there's no broken symmetry. There's an odd number of electrons per unit cell. Uh, so it must be a metal, but it's not. So we somehow destroy, we get around the Leibniz theorem and form a very non-trivial state. So, you know, at some level, the state is rather easy to, to write down. And in fact, Pauling wrote it down in the forties uh, he wrote it down as a theory of metals. Uh, 
he was thinking like a chemist, you know, as a chemist. <laughs> in a theory of metals, uh, that wasn't right. Uh, although we'll see that some of Pauling's ideas will apply later on to certain metals. Uh, and it was Anderson who realized that actually the correct place to think about this type of wave function, the RVB wave function, is in more insulators. Um, so what is the wave function? Well, here's a trial state of it. You take what you do is you take uh, uh, spins and have them form spin singlets. Uh, and then the actual wave function uh, has, is the sum of many, many such configurations. I'm sorry, the animation is not so dramatic on my iPad. Uh, so let me write down the wave function, the actual wave function, uh, uh, psi, is the sum in this simple picture, sum of all possible dimer coverings. So D represents one dimer covering of the square lattice. Uh, and there's some coefficients. Uh, and then you have a state, the state D represents this particular state that I'm showing you. So this state here is the one state D. But there's an infinite number of such states. I mean, not infinite, there's an exponentially large number of states. Uh, you know, if I have a lattice size n, the number of dimer coverings is some number of order two to the power n. So that's how many terms are there in the wave function. Um, and uh, I take the superposition of all of them. So this is a very, very, uh, uh, you know, subtle wave function. It, it, it's, it has a lot of very subtle properties, which took a while to understand. Uh, and uh, in particular, we now know and can prove that you cannot smoothly connect this to any sort of product wave function. Uh, and it implies it has also um, long range entanglement. Uh, and we're going to study a lot of this uh, as we go along. And this is really the simplest situation where such things happen. Uh, it has also any ionic excitations. Uh, people say it has topological order. And it has a way of getting around Luttinger's theorem. And all these things are connected. And that's going to be a, a, a focus of many of the things I'll talk about. Uh, OK. And we also know that I'm calling the Z2 spin liquid because that's, what, uh, that's how it originally appeared in the kind of a Z2 gauge theory of such, uh, such states. Uh, Later on, Kitev uh, discovered this wonderful model called the toric code, which also has all kinds of subtle long range entanglement uh, and properties. And those properties are essentially identical to those of, of this RBB state with a few small differences that we'll also talk about. But so sometimes people say this particular state has a topological order of the toric code. Uh, for parochial reasons, I'm going to call it the C2 spin liquid. Okay, so, uh, so for the triangle lattice, there isn't any clear cut observation of a Z2 spin liquid. But on the Kagame, which is rather simpler, I mean, it's not clear cut by any means, but there is evidence from neutron scattering for a state with a very small gap and also from NMR. Uh, this is experiments of Young Lee and Takashi Imai on this particular compound called Herbert Smithite. Um, and this is the neutron scattering spectrum. Uh, and this is our theoretical modeling of it and seems to work pretty well, uh, gets a lot of the details right. Um, and there's another compound where they, where they have a much clear, clearer measurement of a spin on gap from G over 20. This is another Kagome compound. Uh, but the situation is uh, still you know, not totally settled. Um, okay. And maybe other systems, uh, as I'll show you, have probably the best evidence for zeta spin liquids, uh, which are in uh, Rydberg atoms. Okay, so then to summarize, I've told you about uh, three different types of configuration of electrons on the triangle lattice. Strictly speaking, only one of them is a mod insulator, which is the zeta spin liquid. Uh, the other two, you know. The Luttinger theorem would say, yes, it's possible to get an uh, insulator. Uh, but if you use the Luttinger theorem and band theory to understand this insulator, you get all the energy scales wrong by orders of magnitude. But it's smoothly connected to some, uh, some band insulator. Anyway, so one of them is the, is the non-collinear nail state. The other 
um, is uh, the valence bond solid, just six fold degenerate. And this is the uh, Z2 spin liquid. And there are many, many papers talking about these phase transitions. Uh, some of them are understood better than others. I may say something about them. Some of them are still topics of research. And really also another interesting thing is how they all meet in the center, if that's the topology of the phase diagram. Uh, there's also possibilities here of gapless phases of matter uh, with gapless direct fermions uh, could well be here in, in, in the middle. Um, and that's, uh, again, a topic of a lot of research these days. And we'll, we'll touch the surface of that uh, in somewhere in the middle of the course. All right, so, but anyway, there's no questions. You know, now there are, there is certainly uh, various experimental evidences and exact solutions and so on that mod insulators exist. And the simplest one uh, is this uh, Z2 spin liquid. Okay. Questions? Uh, yeah, okay, as I noticed, there's no completely trivial phase because, uh, in the sense that, uh, well, Luttinger's theorem would say, well, the only way you can get an insert if you break a symmetry, break translational symmetry. Well, these two check break translational symmetry. This one uh, is not allowed to exist. So it can't be completely trivial because you have an odd number of electrons, you have no broken translational symmetry, but it's there. Uh, and, and the reason it's there is because of the presence of uh, this long range entanglement. And, and that allows you to get around Luttinger's theorem as we'll, we'll see. Uh, okay. Interestingly, I should also note that in one dimension, uh, there's the Liebschulz Mattis theorem and its various extensions. Uh, that is never violated. That is always true. Uh, and, the, and, and this type of true violation of the Luttinger idea only is allowed in two dimensions and higher. All right, uh, so okay. I have about half an hour. Any questions on mod insulators? So that, you know, that uh, introduced you to some experiments in mod insulators and will occupy, uh, you know, a big chunk of the course, uh, at least the basic aspects of that. I had one question. Yes, go on. Uh, you mentioned something about uh, uh, Z2 spin liquid having some kind of excitations for Bisons, visions, I, I don't know how to pronounce. Uh, what are yeah. the expectations like? Yeah, so uh, yeah, we'll come to that later, uh, really. Uh, okay. Fine. So yeah, so you may know more of the toric code. The toric code, they're called the E, the M, and the epsilon particles of the toric code. Uh, and yeah. there are analogs of that in, in, in this particular Z2 spin liquids also. In fact, they were discovered earlier. Uh, why is my thing not working? Oh my gosh. Okay. okay, my pen stopped working. Okay, anyway, I don't know, maybe it just needs to be recharged. Okay, but you can all hear me, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. Okay, um, right, so there's the E, the M, and the epsilon particle, and the bison is like the M particle. Uh, the E and the epsilon will turn out to be uh, spin-ons. One is a boson, the other is a fermion. And these are all, these are things we'll talk about in great detail. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, how about systems of bosons? Uh, I, yeah. I asked the question in the chat, that maybe I'll... Is it clear without doing more analysis which transition is second order and when it is first order? Uh, no, no. I mean, well, first of all, any transition can be first order uh, just by just choosing your couplings in a right way. Right. The question is, is a certain transition allowed to be second order? Yeah, so that's uh, not at all, uh, you know, I think, there are sometimes it's subtle. And so, for example, this transition from the Z2 spin liquid to the uh, that certainly, and there's a very well established theory of that. I don't know why my pen has stopped working. <laughs> oh, well. Okay. Uh, maybe, oh, I can't point now. All right. Um, yeah, so the transition from the Z2 spin liquid to the valence bond solid. 
um, is allowed to be second order. And there's, there is a theory of that, that it's completely in good shape. Uh, and similarly for the transition of the Z2 spin liquid to the collinear nail state, that's also allowed to be second order. Uh, the one between the non-collinear nail state and the, uh, and the valence bond solid, uh, that's much more subtle because they're broken symmetries on both sides. So by Landau theory, you would say there's not allowed to be second order, but there is a proposal on how it could be second order. And that depends upon the existence of certain conformal field theories uh, with uh, monopoles and gapless excitations, fermionic and bosonic. And that's a very subtle question, which uh, as you know, um, sometimes there's no definite answer to that. So that's still a question of some debate. Yeah, this one also seems my pen is working again. Yeah. I mean, the examples you presented before for with the O3 model, yeah. So a priori, so there, there's no issue at all, really. I mean, it's not as subtle as these questions. So for the O3 model, you know, the, it's okay. Well, this this is very subtle because there's again broken symmetries on two sides, uh, and so it's not Landau allowed, and we don't know. In fact, even today, I think today I think there's it's pretty well concluded that this is not allowed to be second order. Uh, either there's an, there could be another phase in between that you know we've been talking about recently. Uh, for this case, uh, there's no there's no subtlety at all. In this case, there's uh, two two spins per unit cell, uh, and so this is a totally trivial insulator with no broken symmetry. This one has the only thing that's broken is O3, and there's nothing else going on. So yeah, so this is can be second order. In fact, the numerical evidence is extremely good. And various exponents have been measured to multiple decimal places and so on. So this is really the thoroughly understood boring example. Uh, but on the other hand, this one is not. And operationally, what happens is, uh, at least in the history of these things, there are certain very phase factor. So there, you know, when you write down the path integral for a quantum system, the path integral is not always real. You know, this this looks like a real path integral here, but that came after some cancellation of very phase terms from these two sites, and so um, the, the net thing becomes quite real, and uh, uh, and so there's no issue. But when you go to the triangle lattice. Um, and uh, worry about these transitions here. There are these phase factors, or another way of saying there are certain anomalies that you have to worry about, or there's a Lutinger theorem to worry about. So all these things you have to worry about, and that's the reason, you know, see so here, if you wish, this broken symmetry is kind of enforced by the presence of an anomaly or a violation. Lutinger's theorem says that if you're going to get an insulator, you better break the symmetry. Well, that's so, so that enforcing that is quite subtle in the field here. So you have to keep track of anomalies. Uh, here also, so the, the new thing here is that topological order is present, and that also influences uh, the nature of transition. So, for example, if you looked at this transition, and this was a trivial insulator, you would say this the only order parameter is Z6 order parameter, so it should be a Z6 uh, theory, but it's not. It's not a Z6 theory, it's more complicated because of the, the subtle topological order. But that's one theory that's well understood. And I'll probably say something about it. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's, yeah, ultimately, although I'm not expert in that language, it's all connected to anomalies in some way or the other. That's the difference between this, mo this model and the coupled dimer model that I showed you about earlier. That had, has no anomalies. Okay. And the rest of you don't know what anomaly is, don't worry. I, I barely know myself and uh, I won't, I'll be using a much more uh, pedestrian language mostly. But I'll point you to references where you can learn more. All right, so what about bosons? If you take uh, ultra cold bosons, this is a picture, famous picture from experiments on rubidium atoms, um, and you put them in a periodic potential. Well, if the potential is weak, uh, then they form a superfluid, uh, or a, which is basically a Bose-Einstein condensate. So you can think of the wave function as you 
uh, take the zero momentum state of bosons, that's this state, where bi creates a boson on site i, and then you put all the bosons in the zero momentum state, that's the Bose-Einstein condensate in the ground state. That would be the ground state for free bosons, and this is smoothly connected to that. So that we know is a superfluid, uh, and if you expand this out, you get many, many terms. Uh, and what you notice is that there are large number fluctuations. There's uh, two bosons there and three bosons there. This is just one of many terms in this expansion. Okay. Now, you know, if you write it out that way, you get very, you know, exponentially many terms with large number of fluctuations. If you look at it that way, oh, well, that looks like quantum fluctuations and long range entanglement, but it's not. Unlike the RVP state, this is not that because you can find another basis, which is the momentum basis and write the wave function as a product. This is explicitly a product of bosons in the zero momentum state. So just because you can write it in a form which has lots of fluctuation doesn't mean it's entangled. This is not entangled at all, really, it's just a product. Uh, so that's one state, which is superfluid. Uh, but there's another state when you, make these uh, turn off the interaction between the bosons and make or make the minima of each potential well deeper where the bosons repel each other and get trapped into one per site. And so now the wave function is this. This has also got n particles like this one. It's also a product state, uh, but it's totally different product state. This is a product of site states. This is a product of momentum states. Uh, and this is again a trivial insulator because uh, you can take the Bose Hubbard model and find that this is in the large U limit when you have exactly one boson per site. Uh, this is a state with a gap uh, and breaks no symmetry. So bosons uh, can form a trivial state, but what you notice is they can form a trivial state uh, only when at a certain density, one boson per site. Uh, if you have any other density, then you run into the same issues that you run into fermions, uh, which is that they either form a superfluid or they have to do something else. So let's just consider another density of bosons, uh, say half filling. So bosons were half filled. This state is still allowed, but what about this? This state is clearly not allowed. There's no trivial insulator uh, on like this, but can you write down other insulators? Uh, before I do that, let me just show you that the two problems I've been talking about are basically the same problem uh, because there's a mapping between the Hilbert space of bosons. Let's take hardcore bosons, take bosons only one per site. Sorry, I'm using capital B now, or I use small b here, I'll fix that. So on any given site, there's the empty state or the one boson state. And, you, and in a spin a half system that I was talking about earlier, there are two states, spin up and spin down on each side. So you just map these two Hilbert space to each other. Uh, and then you see that the boson creation operator is just the spin raising operator. Uh, the boson annihilation operator is a spin lowering operator. And the boson number operator, which we assume is conserved, uh, is SZ. Okay. So now there's no SC2 symmetry anymore, uh, but there's still only a U1 symmetry of rotations about the z-axis and rotation about the z-axis correspond to boson number conservation. Uh, so there's only a U1 symmetry, but other than that, it's very similar. Uh, and so therefore- Sir, I have a question. Hello? Yes, please, go ahead. So, so when you put, put a boson in a deep potential well, then there is any, uh, Entanglement? No, no. This is also a product state. Uh, yeah, need both of these are product states in different but in bases. Weak but in weak potential, the wall bosons are in ground state, right? But there is no, yeah. there is also no entanglement. Well, I mean, a, a question of there's always some entanglement. I, I, when I say more precise statement is that. There's no long range entanglement and characterizing long range entanglement is a subtle thing. Uh, and one way to characterize it is this offset gamma term I told you about earlier. So neither of these states has long range entanglement. Of course, there is some entanglement in the actual wave function, but it's, it's short range and it's just given by the area law. Uh, and there are no long range corrections to it. Um, okay. 
But there's a critical point between them, which is in fact turns out to be the O2 relativistic field theory, which also which has long range of time effect. And this is very similar to the coupled dimer system that I mentioned a while back. Okay. All right, so I was talking about bosons, mapping between bosons and spins. And the reason is we, without doing too much work, we can now map uh, whatever we said for systems, states of the uh, spin system with average SZ equals zero to bosons at half filling, not integer filling like I just showed you, but bosons at half filling. And there's also a mapping between you know, the boson Hamiltonian, this is the Hubbard, uh, this is the model with nearest neighbor repulsion V and hopping W. Uh, that's maps onto what's called the XXZ model. What I was talking about earlier is the XXX model where they have the same coupling, the X, Y, and Z direction. Here, the coupling, the X and Z directions are different. So that's why you call it the XXZ model. Okay, so, so sir, there is one question uh, that boson at half filling, physically, what do you mean by half filling for bosons? Uh, mm -hmm. I just mean that the number of bosons is half the number of sites. You take away half of the red circles. Okay. The experimentalists just remove half of them and uh, okay. exactly half. So they can do such things. Uh, and then, uh, then we ask what happens to them. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so from this correspondence, we can now, we can see various things. So I talked about the nail state, the spin up, spin down. I'm sorry, that's not quite a nail state. <laughs> okay, spin up, spin down with a few errors. Uh, so spin up corresponds to boson there, spin down corresponds to boson not there. And so you get a checkerboard state. So this is the state of bosons uh, where you have bosons occupying say the black squares of a chessboard. Uh, and uh, so this state breaks a symmetry. It has double the unit cell. It has some, you call it density wave order or charge density wave order. People have different names for it. Uh, checkerboard state. And this would be an insulator, which is allowed because it's double the unit cell. Um, and there's two, one, there's now an integer number of bosons per unit cell. With bosons here, I, I don't have to worry about even integer because there's no spin. This is analog of blood injury constraints, but there's no factor of two. So each unit cell is exactly an integer number of bosons here. Uh, and uh, so that's one possible state. And then we had also seen this state. This is the, basically the ferromagnet where all the spins point in the right direction, uh, say in the right direction. Uh, and if you think about what this corresponds to, so the spins are pointing in the X direction say, but the X operator is just B plus B dagger. So there's a condensate. So this particular state where the spins all point in the X direction, the X ferromagnet is the superfluid state of bosons. Uh, and then the valence bond solid where the spins form singlets, well, that's, if you write down what the state is in terms of bosons, is the boson hopping back and forth between sites one and two. So the boson is going rattling back and forth. It's on both states. It's in a bonding orbital, if you wish. Uh, and then it's rattling back and forth here and here and here and here, uh, but not there, not as much over here. So there's a broken symmetry and this is a valence bond solid, which is also a possible state of bosons. Um, and the Z2 spin liquid is another possible state of boson, although that's not been seen for this type of system yet. Okay, so bosons at various, especially at half filling uh, are rather closely connected to the anti ferromagnet states we talked about. There's a one-to-one -one mapping between much of the physics. And so this gives you another domain in which to study it experimentally. So question, in the valence bond state is the boson entangled with the vacuum? Oh, I'm not sure what that means, <laughs> sorry. Uh, entanglement precisely, what I'm talking about is entanglement entropy where you, which I haven't really defined, I'm sorry. <laughs> but we will define it when we consider it. Uh, you take some region uh, and then you define, look at the uh, von Neumann entropy of the density matrix that this describes of some region of space. Okay, all right. So I have six, three more topics in about 15 minutes. I don't think I'm gonna 
get through, but I'll let me, yeah, maybe I won't talk about six and seven as much because this really concerns the second part of the course and maybe there'll be another occasion to, to jump to those topics. But the first part of the course will be about, you know, mostly about uh, two, three, four, and five. Uh, so let me at least introduce uh, number five, which is a relatively recent and uh, quite uh, exciting development. Another domain where your people are studying uh, these phases that I've been talking about. Uh, I guess another the common feature of all of these phases is that uh, is that they're ultimately reducible to basically qubits. You know, the spins are qubits. Uh, which have two states, and you have two states on each side, spin up, spin down, or boson present or not present. Uh, and then there's some way of coupling these qubits together, and we are talking about uh, what are the phases these qubits can form. I mean, that's a, still a huge subject and of great interest, but a subject which is you know now getting fairly mature, and lots of things are understood. Uh, topic six and seven is not of that type. What's different when we talk about even metals or six and seven, they're not just a bunch of qubits coupled to each other with local interactions. Uh, they are fermionic. They have things that move from point to point that carry Fermi statistics. So there's a certain extra, extra range of non-locality associated with the fact that they have fermionic objects, mobile fermionic objects. And those are much more complicated. Uh, yeah, so that's very roughly speaking, the, the division between the first part and the second part of the course. Second part of the course will be on fermionic metallic systems where really uh, many of them, there are many open questions. Okay, but coming back to qubit system, another wonderful qubit system recently are uh, Rydberg atoms in optical tweezers. So this is not strictly condensed matter, but it's quantum matter. Uh, they call it quantum simulation, but okay, that's fine. Uh, the AMO people. So here's a Rydberg atom in its ground state. And what they do is they, they trap a single atom uh, in an optical tweezer. Okay. Uh, and so they have a bunch of these optical tweezers sitting by with these atoms. And if they're all in the ground state, they hardly feel each other. But then they bring in a laser or two lasers, in fact, and excite uh, one of the electrons from some uh, low energy state to a very big high energy state, the Rydberg state. So there's the G state here, which is this one, and then the, the R state, which is this state here. And, and this is the, uh, the laser that can flip back and forth between G and R. Now, these two states uh, don't have the same energy, uh, this is much higher energy than that. Uh, but the laser gives you that energy. Uh, but still, there's an energy difference. And that's what's called the detuning delta. So you send in a laser at a certain frequency. Now, if the, if the, if the laser was resonant, had exactly the same energy as the difference between this state and that state, that would correspond to delta equal to zero. What that means is that in the presence of the laser, if you go into some kind of rotating reference frame, then in the rotating reference frame, these two states are degenerate. And you want to be close to that. That's where all the interesting physics happens. But you can, you can tune away. So that's an important knob you have, which is the tuning between the laser frequency and the difference in energy for these two states. Okay, so that's the basic Hamiltonian. This is the, the laser, the Rabi flipping term that flips you from the G to R. And this is the detuning. But now what happens is that these Rydberg states, uh, you know, have a, have a rather large fluctuating dipole moment. So there's a van der Waals interaction between two Rydberg states. So if, if these two states happen to be both be Rydberg, then there's an energy cost. That's this energy Vij. It's only between the Rydberg state on site I and a Rydberg state on site J. So two of the Rydberg states will uh, repel each other. Uh, with a quite a large energy. And that's really what makes this kind of system in coal atoms quite unique. You have a rather very strong interaction between different sites. In the original system I showed you of rubidium, you know, they have seen the mod insulator and they've seen the superfluid, but they haven't really seen much else. And the reason is that the repulsion between, say, this boson and that boson 
is still pretty weak. So it's the interaction is on site pretty much. But in the Rydberg system, you can get very significant uh, offsite uh, interactions, uh, which are can be of order omega or delta. And so you can really tune the full phase diagram with long range repulsion between these excited states. Okay, so here's another view of the same Hamiltonian. This is another showing you the lasers and the detuning and, and so on. Uh, but as a, for our purposes, we forget all those very clever details and just think of it, think of two states that are nearly degenerate uh, with a, uh, which can matrix element between them, which is omega and a splitting in energy, which is delta. That's the difference between these two. Okay. Now, in fact, you can also think of this as a system of bosons uh, in a very similar way. With the, with the ground state, in the ground state here, say there's no boson. If you're up there, there's a boson. Okay. So the repulsion then is just a repulsion between the bosons because it's the up excited states that repel each other. Uh, but there's one difference from the previous boson system that we talked about. Uh, you can create an annihilate of boson. The num boson number is not conserved. The laser can take you back and forth, just add a boson or remove it without any trouble. So this is different from the system you talked about so far because there is no symmetry. Essentially, other than translational symmetry, the Hamiltonian doesn't have any spin rotation or uh, any spin or num boson number conservation symmetry. And this makes a difference, but the, the beautiful thing is that symmetry has nothing to do with the existence of the mod insulate of the of the topological state that the Z2 spin liquid. That can even be present without any symmetry. Uh, and, and so we can't quite e explore the full range of phases that you could explore uh, for antiferromagnets, but you get a different set of phases. And the main difference being that there is no global symmetry to worry about. So the only things you have to worry about are topological order or broken translational symmetry. Okay, so here's one experiment where they took the system in one dimension uh, and, uh, and the, the, these, this, is, this axis is the range of interaction. This is the detuning and some dimensionless parameters. Uh, and what you see, first of all, out here is very dilute phase where there aren't any bosons at all, which we call the disordered phase, or, or we can say it's the trivial phase. Uh, and here there's no problem with having a trivial phase because there's no conservation law. So there's no Latin theorem. zero. Uh, we don't have to worry about any of that or, you know, so, but it's also a problem because, you know, Latin theorem was great because it kind of enforced you to have, it just didn't allow you to have a trivial phase. Everything that could happen would be non-trivial. Uh, here, you know, the trivial phase is around and can be a nuisance. Um, so, okay, but then as you increase the boson density for a certain range of interactions, the bosons form this, occupy every second site. And sometimes they occupy every third site or every fourth site. And this is being seen clearly in the experiments. And then there's interesting phase transitions between uh, the trivial phase uh, and these broken translational symmetry. Okay, now lest you think that that's all over, that's no problem at all. This would be the icing. This would be you know three state parts and four state clock and so on. Is there is a huge amount of literature on Zn models in one plus one dimensions, many of which have been solved. But actually, this turns out to be much more subtle than that. Uh, some of which uh, we studied a while back with uh, with uh, I guess the reference is not here. Uh, yeah, here with no the, with Fenley, Paul Fenley and Sengupta and I studied there. There's a very complicated phase diagram. Here's a phase diagram by uh, numerically by Shapiga and Hila. Uh, and there's a whole regime here where there's a universality class of the chiral clock model, chiral clock model, which is you know, uh, on which there was a great deal of debate uh, starting in the 80s. Uh, and I think things are now settled down partly due to the very beautiful numerical work of Shapiga and Mila and 
and also we did some theory that I won't talk about. Uh, and all of this now agrees well with the experiments and also the numerics. Okay. All right, so that's in 1D. Uh, how about in 2D? So in 2D, you know, you had bosons and half filling. I said, well, they could form a checkerboard state. Uh, well, that's this one does it too. Uh, and that's the checkerboard state here. So this is actually the theoretical phase diagram by work by Brian. And there's an experimental phase diagram, which identical, really it's amazing how well you can do this numerically. But what's uh, kind of fun is you also see uh, many other kinds of orderings because the interactions are you know, rather long range and you can vary the density uh, by just by tuning the, the laser intensity uh, and you can get all kinds of broken symmetries and complicated patterns with interesting phase transitions, uh, which are very much being studied these days by a variety of methods. Yeah. Okay, but this transition then from the disorder to the checkerboard uh, would be of the Ising type, which is the basic fundamental Wilson Fisher conformal field theory in two plus one dimensions. Uh, and that's been studied in this experiment. Well, I don't know, sorry, yeah, this experiment just came out in nature and there's studies of critical exponents uh, and it all seems to work uh, very well. Okay, uh, so the real excitement in the last year or so has been on, you know, not on the square lattice, uh, but on the Kagame lattice. So, and there's two different configurations of those. You can put the Rydberg atoms on the site of a Kagame lattice. Uh, this is what uh, Ryan originally studied numerically. Um, and then you find this trivial disordered phase and then a staggered phase, which has some other arrangement and the magic phase, which has some other arrangement. We had to come up with clever names for them. But what was very exciting and still is not fully understood is this regime here. Uh, and there's, you know, the hope is that there's some kind of Z2 spin liquid here or, or some kind of toric code topological order. Uh, so I won't go into the details of how uh, or why and that's something we're still studying, but let me mention the other uh, the other system, sorry, which has now been studied experimentally, which is the link Kagame lattice. And this was uh, the idea of uh, Ruben Barrison and Ashwin Vishwanath, is to put the Rydberg atom not on the sites of a Kagame lattice, uh, but on the link. So the Rydberg atoms are sitting here. And now you can see, you can think of each Rydberg atom when it's excited as kind of a dimer uh, or a valence bond, because it effectively, you know, doesn't allow any atoms to sit over here. It, and there's a, so there's a constraint of repelling the dimers away from each other. Uh, and so this dimer can appear and disappear. So there's no conservation law of dimers, uh, but they tend to be at a certain density and then they can resonate and form some kind of RBB state. And in fact, numerically, uh, they have very good evidence for a certain model uh, to have exactly this kind of mod insulator, the Z2 spin liquid appearing here. Uh, and so, okay. And this is this evidence from the experiments too that there's indication of that precisely that kind of uh, dimer liquid state uh, that I told you about. Okay, this is, you know, not, not yet published and, <laughs> uh, and there's a lot of excitement and work going on in this direction. Okay. Uh, all right, so I, I guess that's end of my time. Uh, so I've just, I didn't get through our, our topic six and seven. Uh, I'll probably do that at some later stage in the course because um, this really concerns topics that we won't talk about for a while, uh, but you got a good introduction to basically uh, qubit systems is one way to put it. What happens when you take a bunch of qubits in two or two dimensions and couple them together? Uh, what are the things you can form? And the basic lesson is that there are lots of experiments now in a variety of systems showing uh, interesting types of broken symmetries um, and also uh, at least of you know, the basics of topological phases. Um, and there's also you know, various sightings which I haven't discussed but not confirmed really uh, of various novel gapless phases 
uh, involving emergent fermions and so on. And we'll talk about some of those later on. Okay, so, so hopefully you got a flavor of what we're gonna talk about in much more detail and, uh, and seen the many experiments that uh, keep this field exciting, um, which is still very much an ongoing thing. Um, and uh, happy to have a few more questions. Uh, I had a kind of a dumb question about this offset parameter gamma, Subhi. Uh, if you're oh, yes. not long no, range... no dumb questions. Please go on. No problem. Yes. You know, if you're not long range entangled, yeah. uh, even then, presumably the area law L term is only sort of the first term in some uh, series about the thermodynamic limit, right? If I Correct. expand anything. Correct. Yes. So what is the form of the correction if I'm not long range entangled? Uh, it could vanish with some power of L, or if you have a gap phase, it vanishes exponentially with L. Yeah. So, so, so after a L, there's no constant, and the next term will be an inverse power of L or exponentially decaying. Correct. Correct. Right. Yeah. So there's a very nice paper by Tarun Grover and Ashwin Vishwanath, but this is uh, discussed in some detail. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, so just a reminder, you know, you know this is what I'm going to kind of assume uh, at the beginning of next lecture, which we're on a blackboard now, a week from now. So just you know, re refresh your memory or just uh, maybe uh, you can have some tutorial sections at your institute on uh, just the basics of second quantization uh, and uh, what are Green's functions you know, just, oh, sorry, this is taking a while to update. There we go. Uh, yeah, second quantization, Green's functions, and so on. Uh, okay, come on, update. <laughs> uh, all right, there we go. So I'll, uh, and uh, you're welcome to come to my lectures at ICTS on Monday and Tuesday, but that's, you know, that will be a little more advanced uh, than that level of course, uh, starting next week on Wednesday. Okay. Hope that worked well. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, uh, one question. I mean, uh, in the mod, mod physics, uh, you have written the Howard model in the form of Heisenberg model. I mean, as an effective model. Then you... Con yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, then you retain it as a, dim a dimer. I mean... That means there is a one by lambda, j by lambda term. So what is allowing you to write that as a j by lambda term? That is the question. And you have a strict Hubbard model with hopping t on every side, then, yes. then of course all the j's are equal. But yes. I'm just imagining for some reason that hopping t here, uh, this is t1 and this is t2. They have different hoppings in yes. some material. That could happen. It's not not lanthanum copper oxide, and in fact, it does happen in this material, thallium copper chloride. You know where, with this hopping, is certainly different from that hopping. They're different. They're far away. So that's why naturally the J's are different. Okay. So, so okay. Uh, sir, yeah, so instead of the, uh, if we don't take two, if we take four, then will we get the singlet kind of a state? Instead take of taking four. two, yes. Well, I mean, uh, I just took this particular Hamiltonian uh, because it's simple. Okay, uh, this is uh, my choice. I take this Hamilton. Uh, I could take a Hamiltonian where I had four spins which are coupled to each other strongly and coupled weakly to the environment. So you could have a model of coupled plaquettes. You could do that too, and it has actually very similar physics. The most important thing is the unit cell has an even number of spins. So you could take any even number uh, and yes. you'll get the same basic physics. You get a singlet phase and you'll get an ordered phase. Oh, thank okay, you. So the important thing is it's even. That's all. Oh. I should be, there are some questions from the students at TIFR Hyderabad. Uh, sure. For example, uh, one of them was, uh, how do you distinguish between a MOT insulator and a normal insulator experimentally? What would you see as a signature? Well, I, as I said, okay, so let me, uh, let me, yeah. So as I said, it's partly a question of terminology, 
But let's take the terminology I'm using, where I'm defining, you know, Yeah, so, so here are three different insulators. Uh, this one is a true mod insulator. So there's no other way of describing it except using the language of strong correlation. But uh, let me take this one. So this one, okay, I'm saying it's a mod insulator because I'm saying it's a, a well, it's made up of singlets and the singlets have crystallized in this pattern. However, suppose I took another model, uh, you know, another way of describing the state. Uh, I took uh, some hopping matrix element, I took a band system where all of the, these bands were T1, 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 and this was T2. So suppose I took that particular crystal where T2 is much, much bigger than T1 and U equals zero. Suppose I took that system. Well, that system, you know, u equals zero. So I just figured out the band structure and figure out the band structure. You'll have two sides per unit cell and you can, it's a band insulator. All right. So that system is a band insulator. So now I go from this band insulator all the way to T2 equals T1 uh, to u much, much greater than T. Uh, then what well, I think it's possible to go from one end to the other without ever closing the gap, that you just get the same state. So those two states are the same. So this is clearly uh, a, a band insulator. This is this looks a little more complicated because I had to really think in terms of singlets to form this. So it looks more like a model slip. All right, so now the question is experimentally, if I'm assuming the question, how would I tell the difference between this limit and this limit? Well, one way you can tell the difference is to look at the excitation spectrum. So in this limit, you know, you can look at a particle hole excitation, but you, are you, uh, what, how, the way you create an excitation uh, is by taking system from a filled band to an empty band. So you can take a, you create an exciton, you take a, a particle from the spin ba uh, filled band to the empty band. Uh, so now you have a fourfold degeneracy. You have, uh, you can move a spin up or a spin down. And so there's various states uh, with, and they all have exactly the same energy roughly because U is very small. <clears throat> so some of those states are spin singlets and then some of those states are spin triplets and some of those may even involve, yeah, okay. They have basically the same energy. On the other hand, if you look at this system and I look at an excitation where I take an electron from here and put it over there. So I have two electrons per side. That's also an exciton. It's a particle hole excitation. Oh, it's a spin zero particle hole excitation where I move from here to here, but it's got energy U, which is gigantic. So there's a singlet exciton, which has a huge energy, whereas there's a triplet exciton where I just make a spin one. If I make a spin one object, that's like a triplet exciton, but that has a very small energy. So there's this huge variation in energy between say the difference between a singlet exciton and a triplet exciton, which is present here, which is not present there. So, so that's how you would say, well, this is more like a mod insulator because every time I create an excitation where I put two particles on the same side, I have to pay to hue in a huge energy cost. Whereas for the band insulator, I, you don't have to pay that cost. So it's just a question of degree. You can smoothly go from one limit to the other, uh, but it's much better to think of this as almost a mod insulator than almost a band insulator. I see. And so you would see differences in the properties with temperature, for example. Yeah, I mean, this, this would be real differences, you know, not a mathematical differences in the sense of, you know, to a mathematician, those are the same phase because they're smoothly connected. But to a physicist, yeah, the energy scales could be, you know, orders of magnitude different of different properties. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Sir, one more question. I mean, so in the Howard model, as we increase the interaction, so there will be a phase transition between slater insulator to the Mott insulator. So is there any order parameter that can define these phase transition? Uh, so the first of all, no. So there's no phase transition. So that's the point. Suppose I start with a Slater insulator. Yes. I can go smoothly from the Slater insulator to this phase. I can go smoothly from a different Slater insulator, which I just described to this phase, but I cannot go to this phase. So 
there will be a phase transition if you come into the Z2 spin real quick, but not to this or that. Okay. So in fact, when we are studying this phase transition, yeah. in effect, we are studying the phase transition between a state insulator and a mod insulator in the strict sense. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I mean, the, unfortunately, this terminology is well. There's a physics reason for it, you know. Like I'm emphasizing, okay. this is in the mathematical sense, this is a state or insulator, but in the physical sense, it isn't really because the energy scales are so different. <clears throat> okay, great. So, see you in a week. And if you have any comments on, <clears throat> on the technology and how things are working, let me know. Okay. All right. Bye.